Okay, quick quiz. What two mentalities have we talked about? Arithmetic and geometric. Good. We're going to stay in the geometric for this week because there was a lot. It was a, it was a robust time period. Okay. Um, when we talked about the geometric mentality last time, a couple weeks ago, we focused on which mathematician? Pythagoras, right, and the Pythagoreans, and all the groundwork that they laid out for those to come, as well as philosophers that they also laid the groundwork for. What, who were a couple of the philosophers that um, Pythagoras influenced? Plato? Aristotle? Thank you, Jack. Who? That was after, but thank you. Um, yes, and he also influenced Euclid. Uh, he influenced all, you know, so many to come. But I cannot talk about this time period without talking about Alexandria, Egypt. Oh, a couple of questions. Um, how did he come up with this theorem of a squared plus b squared equals c squared? How did he do that? Do you think he wrote a squared plus b squared equals c squared? He drew squares. He did it geometrically. He did it spatially, right? And after, it's inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is, is experimenting, looking for patterns, um, exploring. And after careful observation, he recognized that if you take the length of the hypotenuse and create a square and calculate, the, find the area of that square is equal to the square of the other two sides, of the sum of the other two sides. What were some practices of the Pythagoreans? They were vegan. Come on, guys. What, what did we talk about with the Pythagoreans? Yep. They didn't like the rational numbers. They didn't. Oh, the Pythagoreans did like the rational. They actually came up with the rational numbers. It was the others that did not, the others, if we may, that, that crucified some of the Pythagoreans, the pupils of Pythagoras, because they stated that there were irrational numbers. They were actually killed because of that. Anything else? They had cult practices. They um, lived sort of almost like a cult or a kibbutz, right, together. I'm not putting kibbutz and cult together, two separate things. Yes? Yes, he was, the, he was um, studying the universe, studying spatial, creating a spatial understanding. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to fast forward. Dr. Stewart spoke the week after I did, right? And he talked about the pyramids of Giza. So just as a quick review of what you've been learning the last couple of weeks, who were the pyramids built for? Huh? Pharaohs. Okay, and so they were burial sites. What were those shafts built for? Remember? So, right, so they, they aligned at certain times of the year with certain constellations, right? Okay. Okay, here's your first. Take a look at the diagram and see if you can figure out the relationship between the triangle, the red triangle, and the rectangle. Who thinks they know? Who has no idea? It's OK. Who thinks they know? Alan. That is true. The area of that triangle is equal to 1 half the area of the rectangle. How do you know that? Right, because you could drop an altitude down from the top point of the triangle, straight down, create a perpendicular to the base, right? And so the height of the triangle is the same height as the rectangle, and the bases are equal as well. 
but you all know that the area of a triangle is one half the area of a rectangle, right? If they have the same base and height, correct? Yes. It's also been proven that if a triangle, if two points of the triangle are the same points as two points of the rectangle, the triangle will be one half the base, one half the area of the rectangle. So you see how those two points of the hypotenuse align with the base. What's a mathematical system? That's a tough one. Numbers? Just numbers? Well, there are, we could describe it as sets of elements, right? There's three that we could look at. You know, mathematicians still discuss this, and there's always a little controversy about the, the true definitions. But you could look at it as the concrete system, which is numbers. Then we have an abstract system. And we look at these as elements in a set. OK? And there's the algebraic system. So there's different systems involved in math. And just here's some different definitions um, that mathematicians have agreed upon. Mathematicians seek out patterns, right? And use them to formulate new conjectures, right? Um, systems are based on axioms. What's an axiom? Hmm? It's, it's understood to be true, self-evident, right? OK, so here we are in Alexandria, Egypt. Who was Alexandria named after? Alexander the Great. Good. So when you think about the geometric mentality, you have to go to Alexandria, Egypt, because that was the time and the place where it was bustling with philosophers and teachers, mathematicians, writers. Um, and it was believed to be almost like a mecca of, of intellectual property and curiosity, right? Euclid was a teacher. He was simply one of the teachers there, when I say simply. But his works, what he did, a lot of what he wrote in Euclid's Elements, right? Euclid's Elements has been around, uh, most respected book and most printed book next to the Bible for 2,000 years, most copied and distributed, laid out the axioms, the postulates, the theorems that modern day geometry is based on. Okay? But he didn't come up with all of those postulates and theorems on his own. What he did was he laid out a systematic way of reading and understanding it logically in 13 books. Okay? And the interesting thing, and I'm going to show you some original, well, original, um, images as the way he laid it out. He did, he did use algebraic geometry, but he also used um, just spatial uh, sketches and constructions. OK, so we're going to actually try to interpret some of his constructions in a little while. Um, Alexandria also was, who was the governor? Who was the most? Famous governor of, Alexand of Alexandria after Euclid, Ptolemy. And who was Ptolemy? Have you studied, have they studied Ptolemy? Ptolemy? Ptolemy was uh, an astronomer, a mathematician, a philosopher, okay? He took He looked at the universe as it was laid out previously, and he actually um, redefined the way the planets revolve around the sun. He was not correct, but that's OK. To, to, he, he brought um, mathematicians, astronomers, through a process of thinking and thought that, was, that helped to later lay out the way the planets actually orbit around the sun. Okay. So he, env he envisioned that the planets were orbiting around the sun, but then each planet had its own little orbit, so they were kind of doing this. Not correct, but he was certainly closer than others before. Okay. Um, another interesting thing that he did, I think someone mentioned this last week or two weeks ago, that he did was what happened when people brought their books 
to, Alexandria wanted to have the greatest library, and they were known to have the greatest library, right, of that time. And what happened when people came in with books? Who remembers? Dale knows. Huh? He t yes, they were copied. And did they, what did they, and then as the story goes, very often it was not the original that was given back. It might have been the copy. All right, so, and they wanted to build the greatest library of all time at that time. Um, okay, so we're going to take a look at a, a video. One second. What you have to remember is that this was no ordinary city. Um, it hadn't grown up organically out of the Bronze Age or the Classical Age, like so many of the great cities of antiquity. Uh, this was, if you like, a kind of um, high-minded new town, the brainchild of a visionary and highly educated man. From the age of 13, Alexander had been taught day in, day out by the great philosopher Aristotle, and a spirit of inquiry was imbued in every cell of his body. And when he founded Alexandria, he passed that spirit on into the very DNA of the city. This was a place where knowledge was as valuable a currency as grain or gold. And in a precious archaeological oasis in the heart of the city, Com El Dica, archaeologists have begun to find the evidence to prove it. A Polish team have been working on a discovery which reveals exactly where Alexandria's ideas were played out. Here we are in the, one of the lecture halls. Probably it was uh, one lecture from the complex of the university. It's really interesting, so you've got the lecture rooms right on the main street. Yes, it was the centre of the social life in the late antique Alexandria. Uh, now, he, here, we are here three rows of benches in, uh, in the classrooms, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the benches devoted for the students. And here we have the main chair, topmost seat, for the, probably for the teacher. You can just imagine how intimate this lecture hall would have been, seating just 30 students, studying law, rhetoric and science. And here we have a singular block of stone, and probably this kind of platform or kind of podium for the students' declamation. So, okay, so the students have to yes. do a kind of de uh, to the opposite demonstration. Side to the, uh, teacher. So, let me, I'm going to be the teacher. So if, <laughs> so, if I'm sitting here, so I'm the teacher, <coughs> very comfortably, on your steps, and then the student would be there giving their paper or, yes, or presentation. Exactly. Did it get hot here? Uh, you know, this, uh, the lecture halls were covered probably by the uh, flat roof. We don't have any indication, but probably the auditorium could be high as uh, up to 5,5 metres as the level of the columns. And how many teaching rooms like this are there? Uh, so far we found 20 lecture halls, probably it was much bigger. These teaching rooms were a hothouse of knowledge in the very heart of Alexandria. This was in no way a city of ivory towers. It was buzzing with provocative and cutting-edge ideas. So imagine Euclid actually sitting in one of those arenas, right, working with his students, discussing. And here is the first proof that he provides in his elements. Okay, I want you to take a look at this. So notice there's, besides the numbers that are listed as definition, um, book one, proposition one, problem, this is how he gives the proof of what you see. So what I want you to do is read through it, look at it, analyze it, and decide what is being proved. Who thinks they know? Who could describe? You don't have to say it. Even if, I'm not going to call on you, maybe. Who thinks they understand what's happening up there? I can't hear. Uh, it's not actually, there is no equation, is there? Equation as we call it today with, with algebraic expressions. There is nothing like that. So what does he use? He used diagram, line, construction, right? Circles. So what is this, 
What is this telling you? Well, look at the, the blue circle. So this book, this was rewritten, as you see it today, was rewritten in about 1846. And then the color was only put in just a few years ago. So it's, I can't imagine, without the color, it's even harder to um, discern. But if you take a look at it, you have the blue circle and the black line. What is the black line of the blue circle? It's the radius, right? And then you have the red circle and the black line of the red circle, another radius, right? So what is he saying? If, if you connect the two radii, right, of the two circles, okay, those, so he shows that those two circles have the same radius. And then he said if you draw, who remembers the name? What do we call when two circles overlap like that? And it creates that image. Who remembers what that's called? Venn, uh, Venn diagrams actually are created after, you're right, it does look like a Venn diagram. But the Vesica Pisces, which predates Euclid, OK? But if you take from the two points of the radius and you connect up to the intersection point, he shows that you create an equilateral triangle. OK? And if you read through there, it says, for the black line equal to the yellow line, the black line equal to the red line, therefore yellow is also equal to red. And therefore, that triangle is an equilateral triangle. And this is how he goes through proving hundreds of proofs, theorems. OK, so we did talk about axioms. What's the difference between an axiom? What's a postulate? Is it a theory? Say it again. We don't have, do we have to prove postulates? No. What needs to be proven? A theorem? A theorem needs to be proven. Okay? An axiom is self evident. Okay? It's accepted because it's obvious. A postulate differs from an axiom because a postulate is not self evident necessarily but it's taken on faith, OK? So he lists his axioms. He lists the postulates. And using those, you create a hypothesis, a theory, and then you prove the theory. Okay? That's how all of um, this type of geometrical proof is laid out and used for the next 2,000 plus centuries. So here are some definitions that you all know. Well, actually, we talked about this the other day, that a point has no dimension. All right. A line is in one dimension. And it goes on and on and on. Okay. So the definitions are laid out. Some axioms, things that are equal to the same thing are equal, self-evident. If equals are added to equals, the wholes are equal. Okay? So he created a systematic process of laying this out. The whole is greater than the part. Here are some postulates. To draw a straight line from any point to another point, you could describe a circle with, a ce with the center point and the radius, right? What's the definition of a circle? Anyone? Will. The shape where all, all uh, points on the... Uh, the locus of points. All, all points on the perimeter are equidistant to the center. Yeah. Very good. Thanks. All right. All points in the locus of points are equidistant from the center point. That's what a circle is. Okay. So then we have geometry and algebra, right? It has been fused. He actually did algebraic constructions in his elements, right? But what's the difference between geometry and algebra? How would you describe geometry? Shapes. It's the oldest science to identify and explain uh, spatial understanding, okay? spatial relationships. And algebra is considered a system for computing using letters as symbols. Take a look at this one. 
Notice there's no variables. There's no x, there's no a, there's no b. What is he explaining here? Hmm? Uh, it looks like it could be close to the golden ratio, right? I'm not sure that this particular one is. He uses the distributive law, good. It eventually becomes the distributive law of multiplication. The sum of the areas of the two smaller rectangles is equal to the sum of the larger square, right? So if I would, I don't have a, I would love to write this out. If I had an, if the, if the top width of the red rectangle was A, and the top width of the golden rectangle was B, then the side would be A plus B, if that's a square. So you could write that as A plus B time, times A plus B, right? A plus B squared. Or you could write it as A times A plus B plus B times A plus B, okay? That's how we think of it algebraically. He wasn't using that, he was simply using Symbols, geometric symbols. And then they begin to get more complicated. Here he's proving that the angles of the triangles created within the squares are congruent to each other. That is, today we might call that transitive property. If this equals this, and this equals this, then that equals that. And this is similar to the other one, but now it's three separate rectangles. Okay. One of the other great achievements of mathematicians is recognizing what now is called the golden ratio. In Euclid's elements, Euclid actually laid it out um, as well, and he describes the value of 1.618. and he uses it in the elements. But it goes way before Euclid, all right? If we, you know, when we talk about the evolution of, of humankind, we, we know that forever humans have been curious, right? And so it's understood that for a very long, for as far back as we could recognize, humans try to understand nature. Humans try to understand the world around them. They create symbols to represent the world around them and to be able to communicate the world around them, right? And so it's possible that mathematicians or uh, that people were measuring things in nature and measuring relationships. And I'm not sure who exactly defined this for the first time, but there's a very specific number that happens throughout natural occurrences the way that a pine cone develops, the way that a sunflower develops, the way that um, leaves on a stem of a flower rotate around the stem. The ratio is always the same. The way, um, if you look at even a dragonfly's wings, their eyes, a bug's eyes, made up of hexagons, the way it's laid out, it's always represented, the ratio is this ratio. Here we have a nautilus shell. If you look at a cross section of a nautilus shell and you look at the chambers, the length of a chamber to the width of a chamber, and then the rotation to the next chamber, is always this value called phi, 1.618. And phi happens, if you take any segment, you could take any segment, no matter what the length, and there is a particular point on that segment where one value of x to one value on the other side has the same ratio as 1 plus x over the larger segment. That'll make more sense when I show it to you here. Okay, so you could recognize this, other mathematicians recognize this. If you look at this segment, now this is with the smaller value on top. You could write it either way. If you write the smaller value on top, then you get 0.618 instead of 1.618. Okay, so the golden ratio says that the larger segment over the whole 
is equal to the smaller segment over the larger segment. Okay? What I want you to do is write this down. Actually, I gave it to you on your sheet. Write this down. Cross multiply. Yeah, I gave you the chart to represent this as well. If you take this, well, it's up here. If you take that ratio and you cross multiply it, you're going to get 1 equals x times 1 is x plus x times x is x squared. Right? What kind of equation is that? What? Quadratic equation. OK. If you set in a quadratic equation equal to 0, there's different ways of solving a quadratic equation. What are some ways that you solve a quadratic equation? You can factor it. This one can't be factored. But yes, one is factoring. If you can't factor, what do you do? You can complete the square. OK. And what's the other one? The quadratic formula. OK, so once you have this, set up your quadratic equation and use the quadratic formula to solve for this value. This is all of you right now. Try it out. If you're not sure how to do it, ask the person next to you. Yes, what's the quadratic formula? x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Right, you might have learned it like Pop Goes the Weasel. <laughs> Try it, Yan Wu, you gotta write it down. You got it? So as a radical, phi is an irrational number. Whoa. As a radical, if you wanted to read it as a radical, what do you get for x? Someone I haven't heard from. Harrison, what does x equal? Beautiful. Yes. Negative 1 plus or minus the square root of 5 quantity all over 2. If you simplify that, you get, well, one of the values is 1.618. And when you're talking about a length, it's got to be the positive value. So the negative value you throw out, right? And that is phi. OK. What's really interesting about phi is that not only is it in plants, and animals, but there have been studies on what makes a person beautiful. Okay? And there have been, if you, there are doctors that actually use this for plastic surgery, and I'm going to show you a video in a few moments of a doctor, a plastic surgeon, who created a tool to do this. So they figured out if you look at what's considered a beautiful face, very often the width of the mouth will be exactly 1.618 to the width of the nose. Okay, And then there's phi also in the width of your cheekbones to the width of your mouth. Exactly. And then here. Renaissance artists use this. Who are some Renaissance artists that use this? Da Vinci, Vitruvian Man. If you look at the Vitruvian Man, which you all studied in the ninth grade here, right? you could see phi throughout the painting. And then we talked, you know, who discovered phi? Well, it was, it was recognized in, throughout different cultures around the world. And then if you look at their architecture, there's all kinds of theories and beliefs about how phi has been used in architecture, in different cultures, in different time periods. OK? Um, if you look at the Kaaba, what is the Kaaba? It's in Mecca. It's considered the, high, the most respected Muslim site in the world. It is believed that Kaaba, if you measure the distance from the North Pole and the South Pole, it's, one point, it's very close to 1.618. The Parthenon, if you measure the rectangles in the Parthenon and the triangles in the Parthenon, phi is all over the Parthenon. Um, the pyramids of Giza. If you met, it's seen, it, mathematicians have proven that phi is used in the measurements as well as pi. 
the Mona Lisa, the beautiful face. The Pentagon. So if you create a regular Pentagon, if you create a regular Pentagon in, inside a circle and you inscribe it in the circle, and then you connect every other point in a pentagon. What do you, what's created? It's the blue is beginning. The blue is the beginning of it. You create it. Someone said it. A star. What kind of star is it? A pentagram. Right? Five-pointed star, a pentagram. And then if you look at the lengths within the star, and there's a lot of calculations in here, the relationship always comes down to phi of different lengths and the ratios. You could take that and you could keep calculating in into the other triangles and you come up with the golden spiral. People use phi in, in everyday um, artistry. Stephen's childhood experience not only led him into a career as a surgeon, it also motivated his search for the rules of beauty. And he found his first clues in the writings of a Greek philosopher. Remember Pythagoras? The square of the hypotenuse of a right angled triangle is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides. Thank you, Elizabeth. Yes, him. He claimed not only to quantify or to understand the secret or the code of beauty, he claimed to see it beauty in the universe. That's a pretty big statement. I'm looking for beauty in the face. He says he found it for the, for the universe. That's pretty amazing. What Pythagoras realized is that plants and animals grow according to fairly precise mathematical laws. It's not just chance that flowers unfold in beautiful patterns. And the Greeks found the patterns were based on a particular geometrical ratio. But it wasn't until the Renaissance that an Italian did the maths. He figured out that the key to beauty was the ratio of 1 to 1.618. Grazie. Oh, Miss, Miss Linguini, wait. Take your glasses off. Now let your hair come tumbling down. Miss Linguini, you're beautiful. And yet, and you're not going to believe this, 1.618 actually works. Do something like measure the distance from the floor to your navel, and then from your navel to your head. If you're well proportioned, the ratio should be 1 to 1.618, and that ratio is seen all over the beautiful body. People started noticing it. Artists noticed that the width of the mouth in a beautiful face, for example. Yeah. Not in any face, but it had to be beautiful. If a face was beautiful, the width of the mouth was exactly 1.618 times the width of the nose. Really? If the face wasn't beautiful, that wasn't the case. Dentists, yeah. in their dental work, noticed that the upper front tooth was 1.618 times as wide as the next, next tooth over, the lateral incisor. Uh -oh. So the central incisor was 1.618 times the width of the lateral incisor, the next tooth over. Wonderful. Give me some more examples. Uh, the, your, fingers, the, um, the, your fingers are each called phalanges, uh -huh. and each bone in the finger is called a phalanx. And the phalanx that's most, the closest to your knuckle here is 1.618 times the, uh, the phalanx that's in the middle, and that's 1.618 times the length of the phalanx at the end, which is fingernail. So that was kind of amazing. This number would come up over and over again. This is uh, what's called a golden divider. It divides uh, different line areas or distances from uh, into 1 and 1.618, which is the golden ratio. And in a beautiful face, we'll see that ordinarily the width of the mouth is 1.618 times the width of the nose. And it does in Zara. Exactly. Right. If we look at the teeth, we can see that ordinarily 
show me your teeth and smile a little bit. The width of the upper front tooth is 1.618 times the width of the tooth right next to it, and the same on the other side. The width of the upper front tooth is 1.618 times the tooth next to it. It's amazing how this proportion uh, is repeated over and over again on a beautiful face. And the same thing with Zara. If I, if I uh, do the width of her mouth, I'm sorry. Oh, so there you go. <laughs> I, I'm a surgeon. Scary. I'm used to sharp things. <laughs> I hardly ever cut myself. Okay, so. so if I do the width of her mouth to the width of her face, the camera should be able to see that this, uh, the width of the mouth is 1.618 times the distance from the, the mouth to the corner of the cheek. And it is. Anyway, this, this relationship holds up over and over again in the face. Mm -hmm. And Zara's a great example. That's why she's so pretty. So Zara's face fits the golden ratio. It's not bad, is it? Mm -hmm. so <laughs> now, this idea that maths can explain a beautiful face, any beautiful face, has been taken even further by Stephen Marquardt. So if I look at the nose, the nose is a triangle. Mm -hmm. On the front view, on the side view, the nose is a triangle again. Mm. And in a beautiful face, the sides of the triangle are 1.618 times greater than the base. And from a triangle, you can build a pentagon. What's the most attractive configuration of the face, the most attractive expression? Smile. Smiling. Yeah. When I smile, oh, you start what? to see the pentagons here. Yes, I here. do. There. Okay. It's the there, there, there. All right, exactly. Stephen Marquardt combined pentagons and triangles, all with the 1.618 ratio, and built a mask. He claims that the closer a face conforms to his mask, the more beautiful it is. Let's start with, say, Kate Moss. All right. You know, Kate looks totally different than the others. All right. But if I put the mask on her, you can see that it fits very closely. The interesting thing about Kate is that her eyes are uh, preternaturally wide or unusually wide. Her eyebrows fit beautifully. Her lips, her nose, her jawline is very, very nice, even if the hairline is exactly where it should be. And it's not just women. The same mask can be put on men. And Tom Cruise fits it perfectly. In fact, Stephen claims it fits any human face so long as it's beautiful. Um, now, uh, here's another Renaissance painting. Does any, can anybody identify this painting? School of Athens. Very good. Who painted the School of Athens? Raphael? Raphael? I actually took this picture this past summer in the Vatican, and I, so I cut off, it was very hard. It's a beautiful mural in a small, relatively small room, and so it's very hard, of course, with tourists everywhere to try to actually capture the whole thing at once. But what does the School of Athens attribute to? Philosophy, the intellectual curiosity, right? It's a celebration of that. And does anybody know some of the people represented here? Who they are? Who are the two men right in the middle? Plato and Aristotle. Okay. Does anybody know who this is? Pythagoras? Euclid. Does anybody remember uh, Raphael did a self-portrait, right? It was a common thing, Terry, at that time, for people to, they didn't sign their paintings. They actually put in a self-portrait. Does anybody know where Raphael's self-portrait is in here? It's hard to see. He put his face right in the corner, looking out. OK, thank you. You can finish up your uh, questions, please. Thanks.